Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. So here let's look at a quick overview of 70 tools and features that Unity has. This is actually a lecture taken from my Ultimate Unity Over course, which you can pick it up with the link in the description. There are individual lectures explaining each of these tools and features in detail in the course. Over here let's look at a quick overview, starting from the absolute basics until the more niche complex tools. Try to see how many of these you actually not know about. In this lecture we're going to see a quick overview of all the lectures and all the tools and features we're going to learn in this entire course. Okay, so we're going to start off this course with the absolute basics, so starting off with the Unity versions, we're going to learn what is a preview version, what is alpha, beta, and LTS versions, as well as which one you should choose. Then we're going to learn about the Unity Hub. This is the program that manages all your Unity installs and all your projects. It's where you create new projects, like templates, and upgrade them. Next, we're going to learn the basic editor windows, learn about the hierarchy, the inspector, what is the project window, difference between game and scene view, and so on. After that, we're going to learn how the Unity layout is customizable. You can place windows pretty much wherever you want them. So you can set up your own custom layout, or you can follow my own, and then you can also save it. Next, we're going to learn about the various rendering pipelines that Unity has. There's the built-in render pipeline, the universal render pipeline, and the high-definition render pipeline. This impacts what shaders you use and how your game will render. The right pipeline also depends on your target platform. Then we're going to learn about the package manager. A lot of things in Unity are actually in their own packages. They don't all come installed by default. And this, the package manager, this is where you install and uninstall those various packages. Doing it this way keeps Unity nice and modular, so you only need to install the packages that you need. Next, we're going to learn about 2D and 3D. Unity is capable of making both. And most things in game development are the exact same in 2D and 3D. So here we're just going to learn about the handful of things that are different. Things like the camera setup, using sprites instead of meshes, and so on. Then we're going to learn about visual scripting. This is how you can make entire games without any code at all. This is a visual tool where you connect nodes to one another in order to set up some logic. You can combine it with C Sharp, or like I said, make entire games just with visual scripting. Next we're going to learn about post-processing. This is one of the easiest ways to make your games look really awesome. The difference between with and without post-processing is truly insane. Then we're going to learn about another sort of post-processing effect, but one that is added in a different way from all the others. This one is ambient occlusion. This is one of my favorite effects. It adds some shadows to your game to make everything feel much more grounded. Personally, I always add this one. After that, we're going to learn about text and the difference between the legacy text and Text Mesh Pro. Text Mesh Pro is super capable. You can message your text in any way you want. Then we're going to learn about prefabs, what exactly they are and how you can play around with them. These are prefabricated objects. You can easily create a prefab and spawn any number of copies. Then we'll learn about the Unity package. This is Unity's own file format for storing multiple files in a single file. You can export your own Unity packages and import others. For example, my own utilities are in a Unity package. By the way, this is also different from the Unity package manager. These are just simple files. Next, we'll learn about grids. Unity has a bunch of tools to help you organize your objects in your world. You can set up some visual grids. You can define the size, enable or disable snapping. So this one is super useful for doing level design. Then we're going to learn about render texture. This is an awesome Unity feature where you can render a camera onto a texture, so what the camera sees is actually drawn onto that texture. Then of course you can use some shaders to make some really interesting things with that texture, or perhaps just make a simple minimap. After that we'll learn about the video player. This is how you can play some videos, meaning some mp4 files or other formats, and you can play them directly inside Unity. This is an excellent easy way to show some animated video directly in your games. For example, a lot of games use this kind of thing for things like tutorials. Then we'll learn about one of the most powerful Unity tools, the Shader Graph. This is a visual tool that you can use to make your own custom shaders. This one is insanely awesome, insanely powerful. Personally, I cannot write any text shaders, but I can do quite a lot of awesome things using Shader Graph. Next is the Trail Renderer. This is how you can easily set up a trail directly in your game. You just add a component, and as the object moves, it will automatically spawn a trail, so it's super easy to use. And of course, you can customize it with all sorts of options, including using some custom shaders. Then we'll learn about the Unity microgames. This is something that Unity has made where you have some tiny games with some tutorials and all the source code available. These can be a great starting point if you want to try out some new idea. Next, we'll learn about ProBuilder. This is a tool inside Unity that will help you make some 3D modeling directly inside the engine. That way you don't need to use a third-party external tool. This one is actually pretty capable and it is insanely useful for something like quickly greyboxing a brand new level. Then we'll learn about render pipeline objects. This is something you can add to your renderer asset that allows you to render some objects in different ways. 
This makes it really easy to do things like a see-through visual, or just render different objects with a unique shader or make something cut out. You can play with shaders, layers, and a bunch more. Next, we'll learn about assembly definitions. If you have issues with code compilation time, then this is what you want to learn about. You can split your code into multiple assemblies, and when you modify something, you only need to recompile the assembly that changed. So on a large project that has tons and tons of files, this kind of thing can save you a ton of time. Then for resources, this is a special folder in Unity that allows you to dynamically load objects at runtime without having some direct references. This can be a really great way to load objects and control memory. As long as the target object exists inside the resources folder, you can load it in any way you want. Although this one is more meant for simple use cases, it doesn't have much complexity. If you want to do loading of more complex things, for that you want to use addressables, which is covered later on in the course. Next, we're going to learn about game object icons. This is a tiny thing, but it's quite useful, especially in large projects. It's how you can add icons to your game objects and easily see them in scene view or game view. After that is a super important lecture, one about pivot center and local global, these two buttons. You really, really need to know about these. If you don't, then you will go insane at some point. These buttons affect where the handles appear on the select object and how exactly it is modified. If you don't know what these buttons do, then if you accidentally click on them, then all of a sudden your handles will behave very strangely. So definitely make sure you know about this. Then we're going to learn about the script execution order. This is how you can define which scripts run and in what order. Usually you don't need this. Your code should ideally not depend on any specific order. But sometimes you really do need one script to run before another one. And if so, then over here you can set the specific order to make sure it always works. After that, we cover the hierarchy buttons. These are some buttons that show up in the hierarchy that allow you to hide or lock objects. Really useful when you have tons of overlap. Then we're going to learn where the various logs are stored. Logs for the editor, logs for the final build, and how it actually keeps multiple versions. After that, we'll learn about NevMesh. This is Unity's own built-in pathfinding solution. You can bake some navigation meshes, then create agents, and they will traverse that mesh. Next, we're going to learn how to set up Visual Studio using packages, meaning how you can actually see the source code for the various Unity packages that have the source code available. You can open those packages in Visual Studio and modify them in any way you want. Then we'll learn about player prefs. This one is one of the easiest ways to save data in Unity. It is not meant for storing complex data, but for simple things like game settings, then this is really perfect and really easy to use. Then we'll learn about the difference between the legacy input manager and the input system package. These two are quite different. Although the legacy one still has its use cases, it is super easy to use while the input system is much more capable, but also a little bit more complex. So speaking of that, the next lecture is exactly on the input system. This is a super powerful tool for handling input. You separate the actions from the actual physical inputs, which makes it really easy to make your game playable on anything, mouse, keyboard, game patch, touch, and so on. Then a super useful lecture, one on how to find class names and namespaces. This is super important to know in order to learn how to interact with all the Unity tools and features through code. You can inspect the source code to see how it all works. Then we cover animation versus animator. These are two separate animation systems that Unity has, the legacy animation system and mechanism. Mostly you want to use the mechanism animator, but the legacy animation component, that one still works and it is super easy to use. So for simple things, it is actually still quite useful. Next, we'll learn about all of the animation window properties. This is where you can make your own animations. You can set up keyframes for anything you want to store, any field, any data. You can look at the curves to see how all the parameters change. There are quite a lot of options in this window and here we're going to learn all about it. Next is a lecture on the animator. This is where you have your state machine for all your animations. You can define all the states, all the animations in various states, then define all the transitions and how exactly they are triggered. Then we'll learn about the animator blend trees. This is a really awesome feature where you can combine multiple animations into a single state. It is how you can have animations for moving in all directions and choose the correct animation to play based on parameters. Next, we'll learn about animation avatars. This is the file that is on a per mesh basis that links all the bones with the actual body parts. You need to make sure to use the right animation avatar for that mesh in order to retarget the animations. After that, we'll learn about the animation rigging package. This is a super cool package for helping you do inverse kinematics, or IK. This is how you can add some dynamic movement on top of your animations. You can do things like having the legs play a walk animation while the upper body holds a weapon and aims toward the target. Then we'll learn about the ProBuilder cut mesh feature. This is a really awesome feature. It's marked as experimental, but usually works great. You can take two meshes and do some operations on them. 
you can join, intersect, or slice, so it's really great for modifying whatever assets you already own. Then we learned about raw image versus image and sprite versus texture. This is pretty important to know, you need to use the right component depending on the import options of your assets. After that we'll learn about the Unity web requests. This is how you can do an HTTP request to some web server. You can use this for literally anything, for example contact the server to check the latest version of your game, or maybe download some custom mods. Next you'll learn about a bunch of UI effects that Unity has by default. These are really easy to use, just add the component and it all looks pretty good. You can add some shadows or some outlines. Then we learned about Ragdoll. This is exactly how you set up a Ragdoll in your game. You just assign all the body parts and the Ragdoll wizard will automatically set up all the colliders and rigid bodies to make them have physics. Adding Ragdolls is always a great way to add more polish to your games, and thanks to this wizard it is actually surprisingly easy. Then a super important lecture. This one is not an Unity feature, but it's still extremely important. It is my four step process for solving null reference exceptions. This is the most common error of all, so knowing how to solve it is extremely valuable. After that, we'll learn about JSON and JSON utility. First, what exactly is JSON? It is a data format to organize whatever that you want as text. And then JSON utility, this is a Unity class that helps you convert to and from JSON. Next, we'll learn about addressables. This is a slightly complex tool, but one that is really powerful. It allows you to have control over how you manage your objects in memory, how you can choose when to load them dynamically. Then a lecture on how to set up addressables with a remote URL, meaning how to grab addressable data from a remote server. This is how you can make things like have your game with some sort of special event without having to update the build executable. The game just grabs the latest addressables from a server and you can very easily update that one. Next is Cloud Content Delivery. This is Unity CDN, it is their content delivery network. You can host your addressables data yourself if you want, but using Unity's Cloud Content Delivery makes it so much easier. After that, we're going to learn about dynamic resolution. This is how you can render your game at different resolutions to make it run better on weaker machines. You can set this up dynamically so it automatically scales up or down depending on demand. Next, we'll learn about the build size report. This report is a pre-hidden feature of Unity, but it's actually super helpful. Here you can see exactly how big your build is and what assets make up that size. If you're making some game that you need to be compact, then this report is super useful for figuring out exactly where you can optimize. After that, we'll learn about Unity Authentication. This is an essential step in using many of their tools. Thankfully, it's pretty easy to use. You can sign in anonymously or with an actual account. Then we'll learn about Remote Config. This one allows you to define some parameters in the Unity dashboard on the web. Then you can set up the game to grab those parameters to do something, like for defining some boss's health, and through the dashboard you can update those values without having to modify the build. Next is game overrides. This one is similar to remote config in that you define some parameters on dashboard, but rather than just some simple values, you can actually override lots of things. So you can use this to make things like a Christmas event, where it will override a bunch of assets, but only while the event is live. Then we'll learn about netcode for game objects. This is Unity's own tool for helping you make multiplayer games. It is really easy to use, just add some simple components and you have a full network connection working. It is infinitely easier than it was many years ago. This is their tool stack for game objects. There's another one specifically for making dots multiplayer games. Next we'll learn about Lobby. This is a tool that helps you group your players together before starting a multiplayer game. And after that we'll learn about Relay. This one helps you connect your players together even if they are behind firewalls or not. This one is a must for any player hosted games. After that we'll learn about game server hosting. This is their tool for setting up dedicated servers. You can make the server build and it will automatically spin up or down more or less servers depending on demand. Then comes the matchmaker. This one helps you match players together based on various parameters. So you can define some skill rating and only match players with similar skill. Or you can do it based on geography, time play, or really any rules you want. Next is cloud save. This is a really useful Unity tool for storing player data in the cloud. This is how you can give your players cloud saves, meaning let them save their player file or save files in the cloud so they can play from anywhere. After that is the decal projector. With this one you can project some textures onto your geometry. It is projected so it takes the shape of whatever geometry it's pointing towards. So this one is perfect for things like bullet holes or bullet effects. Then we learned about the frame debugger. This one lets you pause your game and analyze each of your game's frames as they are being rendered. You can see all the exact passes and all the materials and shaders that are being used in each pass. Then we have Cloud Diagnostics. This one is one of my favorite tools. 
It is super easy to use, you just toggle on an option and it will automatically receive information when your players encounter some errors or some crash. Next is user reporting. This one works on top of cloud diagnostics to support some manual player reports. Players can include a screenshot with their problem and send it to you as a developer so you can fix it. Then we cover the localization package. This one is really awesome for localizing everything in your game. It supports text, audio, images and really any asset type. Localization is super important and something you should definitely always do. Thanks to this package, it is surprisingly easy to do. After that, we cover the Text Mesh Pro fallback feature. This one is especially important with localization. You can add a fallback font so you can render various fonts for various texts using different glyphs. Alright, so yep, that's all the contents in this course. As you can see, Unity has tons of tools and features that do all sorts of things. By learning about these, you will make yourself much more productive. Chances are you didn't even know some of these existed, so now you do, and by watching that lecture, you'll learn how to use that tool or feature. Alright, so yep, that's an overview of the 70 tools and features explained in my Ultimate Unity Overview course. If you want to learn about all of these in more detail, then check out the full course with the link in the description. Alright, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.